You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. From Grand Tours to group rides, the Champs-Élysées to coffee stops, Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Today, we are in Tel Aviv. Obviously, it was my phase one, I'd say, in the, in the whole process to this Giro, was trying to get this jersey. And, and the plan and the dream was to bring it to Italy, you know. So we had two stages here, but, you know, so we're just talking about things what well, did not happen. <laughs> That was BMC Sports Director Max Chandri in last night's episode of the Cycling Podcast from the Giro d'Italia. He thought their pink jersey dream had faded after Rowan Dennis was beaten in the opening time trial. And we are recycling material already. (laughs) (laughs) Day (laughs) two. Waiting to jump in and say, (laughs) spoil my beautifully crafted (laughs) opening. Um, But BMC, they pulled it out of the bag and the pink jersey is on the shoulders of Rowan Dennis this evening. We'll talk all about that in this episode of the Cycling Podcast. My name's Lionel Burney and I'm with Richard Moore. Whew, nice intro, Lionel. Is that you practicing for when I'm not here? Well, you know, I, I, yeah. Where I mean, are we? We're in Tel Aviv. We can't quite see the sea, but by the time we came out of the press room, it had fallen dark. It gets dark pretty early here at this time of year. Early and quickly. Early and quickly, yes, indeed. A feature of this part of the world. And uh, we had a stage today that started in Haifa. Are you giving us a tale of the tap? I will do, yeah. yeah. I think. So. Yeah, I was going to give you a couple of interesting little factoids about Haifa. Go on then. A beautiful city, apparently, that we only really saw the football stadium. Uh, we didn't see, which is, I believe, shared by the two main football clubs there. Um, it is Haifa twinned with, among other places, Hackney. Really? Did you know that? Twinned with a lot of places, but Hackney. Hackney. Wow. Hack- connection, Hackney cycling connection. Teo Gagan Hart. Yeah, not riding here, unfortunately. No. And the Red Hot Chili Peppers founding guitarist Hillel Slovak was born there. Did you know that? Wow. No, I didn't. He unfortunately died of a heroin overdose in 1988, but he was born there. So you've obviously Googled Haifa today. <laughs> <laughs> well done, me. But at least you saw the most dramatic moment of the race, which I completely missed because I'd gone down to the finish line area in search of uh, someone I wanted to interview for Monday's Kilometre Zero. So I missed a dramatic action on stage two of the Giro from Haifa to Tel Aviv. It was short, um, 167 kilometres. We'll talk a little bit about the route they took. It wasn't terribly inspiring. The uh, last 15 kilometres approach into high, uh, Tel Aviv was quite attractive. As, a, as expected, a sprint finish. And as expected, Elia Viviani of Quickstep won the stage. As somebody very witty on Twitter said, Elia Tel Viviani. Oh, I can hear the groans from here. I think those are motorbikes, actually. <laughs> Apologies for that. We are on a quite busy street here. It started off as a fairly run-of-the-mill opening stage of a Grand Tour, opening road stage of a Grand Tour. Davide Ballerini of Androni, Victor Campanets of uh, Lotto Fixall and Guy Neve of the Israel Cycling Academy tried to get away. No one was letting that go because Campanets, of course, was only two seconds down on GC. Not the most tactically smart move, that one, trying to sneak away at the start of a (laughs) 100-mile stage. But uh, anyway, that didn't work. Ballerini then went again. He's not famous for subtle. To the Izzy old Campanarts. <laughs> well, funny enough, I didn't know how it had worked out with his asking somebody out for a date in the time trial of the Giro last year when he unzipped his skin suit and had a vest asking somebody out on a date. Uh, I asked this morning at the team, you know, I didn't want to put my foot in it. Asking the hard questions <laughs> here, Lionel. <laughs> and I was told, well, they went out on a date, but it didn't go any further. So uh, anyway, no. you, you can't win them all. Lars Back reacted to Ballerini's second move. And uh, a little bit later on, Guillaume Boivin, the Canadian rider with the Israel Cycling Academy team, he got across to make it three riders at the front. So far, nothing particularly uh, noteworthy. But then just before the fourth category climb and intermediate sprint, second intermediate sprint, BMC went to the front and started to chase really quite hard. They brought the gap right down. They didn't quite close it before the climb, but they brought the gap down enough that Enrico Barbin 
of Bardiani was able to jump across and he pipped Boivin to the points at the King of the Mountains. But then came the second intermediate sprint, the pivotal part of the day really. BMC led out Dennis to take the three seconds on the line and that meant he jumped one second ahead of Tom de Moulin overall. So Dennis now does have the pink jersey to take possibly to Sicily if he can uh, survive tomorrow and he completes the collection of all three Grand Tour leaders jerseys. After that the finish was fairly straightforward, it was, didn't look terribly difficult for Viviani, that's his second Giro stage win in his career. Jakob Moretzko of Villiers was second, Sam Bennett the Irish rider with Bora was third, Dennis in pink, Viviani in the points jersey, Barbin in King of the Mountains and Max Schachmann the best young rider. Seems a little bit unfair to say that the, the most exciting part of the day was was a bit unfair on Viviani, perhaps, who obviously won the stage, and that, that's quite a quite a thing to do. But but it's I mean the the point I suppose is I don't know many people who are great fans of the intermediate sprints or feel that they've really added an awful lot. But today they they genuinely did, and BMC deserve an awful lot of credit for having that audacious plan. And, and then executing it so well. It was about a three-minute gap they closed in, about 20 kilometres. We weren't... I think, I think looking back, that's, that was about... Um, which is good going. You know, that's really good going. Um, and they were fully committed to it. And uh, Jürgen Rolands was the guy led out, Rowan Dennis, who did a really good job. Now, Dennis afterwards did say that he had gone around the bunch just checking with some of the other key riders whether they were going to contest it. And de Moulin told him that he wasn't bothered, so he kind of gave him the, the okay to go for it. Um, and some some people speculating that Viviani also, who was up there, uh, let him have it because it was there was there was more at stake for Dennis than for Viviani in that moment. But nevertheless, it was extremely well done. Full credit to them. Um, I spoke at the finish to Nicholas Roach, who was a crucial part of that. Now, at the start of his career, Nicholas Roach did get up there in bunch sprints, so he knows how to handle himself in that sort of situation. That, an intermediate sprint isn't exactly the same, but he did a very, very good job. He led through a kilometre to go and did a good turn at the front before Jürgen Rollins took over. And here he is at the finish, Nicholas Roach. An outstanding job you did there to help Rowan get the, get the sprint. That plan you had in the morning. We had the idea. We had a couple of ideas, as you can imagine. If I can say they're kind of the perfect plan, which uh, almost never happens in cycling, but uh, we thought we'd give it a go. Initially, we... We wanted to have a look at uh, the lotto rider who was very close and we knew he was going to try. And the guys did a perfect job to, uh, to chase him down every time he went. As the gap was quite controllable, about 40, 50k before the sprint, we thought that we have nothing to lose. Rowan took the responsibility with the director and said, let's go for it. Uh, if we lose, we lose, but at least uh, you know, it's 50k, give it a go. And I think the team planned it well and, um, and Rowan finished the job well for the for pink jersey for, for tomorrow. We used to see you in bunch sprints, of course. Did you some of that experience come in handy there? Yeah, I enjoyed it already in uh, in Oman. I led out Greg a, a few times, and it's <laughs> it's something that I that I started with, and I, and I did enjoy it. Obviously, it's one thing leading out a bonus sprint, and it's another thing going into the into mass sprint. This week, this this Jempy has a few opportunities, and uh, I think I might give him a hand here and there. But as uh, you know, I think today was quite exceptional. Quite deflated maybe last night because I know that the, the team wanted the uh, pink jersey for Andy Reese, didn't they? So was the plan hatched last night to try and salvage something today? Well, the plan was obviously to get it yesterday, uh, and I think Rowan really, really was eager to to get that that win in, in that prologue, and he he was super ready. And uh, you know, he just got beaten by a stronger rider on the day, uh, as he said himself. We knew that today was still an opportunity with only two seconds. There was a lot to be done to make it happening. The team did whatever we, we could to, to at least try and uh, it was great to, to succeed. Yeah, it's interesting that point, Richard, about Rowan Dennis kind of canvassing opinion to see what kind of opposition they might encounter in going for that uh, intermediate sprint. But if you think about it, it was kind of win-win all the way round, wasn't it? Because de Moulin and Sunweb, they don't want to have to defend the pink jersey for longer than is necessary. It doesn't materially change the uh, complexion of the race for de Moulin just to slip out of the jerseys, not doesn't move in relation to any of the other favourites. Viviani and Quickstep wouldn't have minded the fact that that break got brought back under control nice and early and uh, made things a bit simpler for them in the finale. I suppose the only team that could have mounted any opposition would have been Lotto Fixall. But from what I gather, because as I say, I didn't actually see what happened, but BMC, they bossed it. It wasn't like they were going to, once they committed to that move, it, they weren't going to surrender it at all. No, and... and We've so seldom seen teams doing that for an intermediate sprint. Uh, it, they risked having, I suppose, egg on their face if it didn't work out. If they'd done all that work, closed the gap, and then 
he hadn't won it. Um, so well, well done them, and uh, and a great result. And I mean, Rowan Dennis didn't mention his press conference, so I'm sure he did mention in his other interviews that Andy Reese obviously died um, a couple of weeks ago, the owner and um, you know funder of of BMC, and it meant a lot to them. They don't have an awful lot of other targets here. I wouldn't have thought BMC. So. Um, that's a huge result for them. And Ron Dennis, you know, does have aspirations to develop into a GC rider, a Demula style rider, I suppose. He's not dissimilar in terms of his 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 skills and his ability. A bit smaller than Demula, so he'll be wanting to get a lot more out of this Giro over the three weeks, I would imagine. We've sometimes given BMC a bit of a hard time, haven't we, for being a rudderless ship at times. And I remember, was it two years ago at the Giro when they really didn't seem to have any objective at all? I remember talking to Max Chiandri then uh, for a kilometre zero about how a team copes when they don't really have a, a, a rider for the overall and they don't seem to be managing to get in the brakes. He was uh, disarmingly frank, wasn't he, he was, about, yeah. about his riders? Yeah, and he said, you know, that sometimes you just have to tell them, look, you've got to get in the bike race. But after the disappointment, and I saw that disappointment firsthand last night, Pinotti and Chandri particularly were, you know, their chins were on the floor. They thought Dennis had a really good shout at winning uh, the opening stage time trial. But to lift themselves overnight and to have everybody in on that goal and say, right, we're going to try this. And like you say, Rich, it's not without risk that because, you know, no one wants to put everything on the line, fail, and then everyone have everyone kind of sniggering up their sleeves um, at, at what was a, you know, a cheeky-ish um, but understandable attempt to pinch the pink jersey. But inspired. Poor old Campenarts was, uh, his desperation was obvious when, in the, in the lull after the sprint, he had another go. He went off on his own, you know, 60 kilometres to go. And uh, he's, you know, got a 15-second lead and he's sort of settling down into the time trial position and you're thinking, really? That wasn't going to work, was it? I know it's the team tweeting, you know, go, go. But I don't, I'm not sure the sports director would have been uh, would have been sharing that sentiment. Um, so, Ron Dennis in the pink jersey and Tom de Moulin at the finish did appear quite relaxed about that clearly it's in his interest too a community around the world stories and films with the most compelling characters the world's finest apparel Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Thank you very much to Rafa for sponsoring us and allowing us to be here, here at the Giro d'Italia in Israel, heading over to Italy on Monday, covering the whole race. And uh, we mentioned last night our Peddler de Charme range that's on Rafa at rafa.cc. Kirk Pedrick sent us a picture on Twitter this morning of him in his Peddler de Charme jersey. Looked fantastic, obviously good weather, wherever you are, Kirk, so... Um, you can go to rafa.cc or thecyclingpodcast.com and the shop. Forward slash shop. Forward slash shop, and that'll take you to the Rafa page, our page on the Rafa website. Um, we've got a competition, haven't we, to announce? We have, yeah. <laughs> Lionel well, landed you in it there. You, uh, when, well, basically retweet um, our tweet announcing this episode, stage two of the Giro, with why you listen to, just a small comment, why you listen to the Cycling Podcast. Um, so retweet us with a comment and uh, you'll be entered into a draw and on the rest day we will uh, pick some winners we've got some various rapper some and really science good and stuff sport. actually yeah Rafa we've got some and science and sport kit some goodies gear goodies products. yeah so you've got to be in it to win it so retweet any of our tweets really with them with a message from you saying why you listen to the cycling podcast and, and keep and them the, clean and the most bear sarcastic will win <laughs> well <laughs> yeah keep them clean bear in mind we might read these and you know mor <laughs> morale's fragile enough as it is we should mention we had a, a phone message that we played last night from Stephen Tunstall about the ride that he's doing in Israel at the moment uh, that was interesting we had a, a, another message uh, today from Ben Miller thank you Ben for your message that was very kind of you to say what you said and, and to uh, mention the, the coverage that we've tried to give you of uh, our few days here in Israel and we will be covering that at greater length in our Monday morning episode of Kilometer Zero the first of nine episodes of Kilometer Zero uh, which will be available to friends of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com you can sign up for that that's coming together nicely we've been speaking to a lot of people about their experiences of impressions of misgivings about 
uh, being here in Israel. We've also spoken to people who live here, fans and, and people involved in the sport here, and, and some writers and some very interesting comments. Um, George Bennett, in particular, the Lotto NL Yumba writer, had some very interesting things to say about being here. Uh, so you'll hear all that on Monday. Um, but Lionel, today we left uh, Jerusalem in the morning and drove all the way to Haifa on the way to Syria. We're pretty close to Syria there. It's just fascinating to look at the the, map, the wider map and just see where where we are in the world and, and, and the, the countries around here, um, which is another really important bit of context in understanding Israel and, and, and the politics here. And we got a glimpse of the wall, didn't we, today? Um, which, you know, is it covers about 450 miles of Israel. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the race uh, followed a, a pretty straightforward route up the, more or less up the coast here to Tel Aviv. There were lots of shots actually on television of, of the coastline, mm. which actually weren't shots anywhere no, near the race. That clever was, bit of TV direction, I think, because uh, as the race was taking a sort of four or five lane highway, not the prettiest road for a lot of it, it has to be said. Um, the helicopter was obviously flying parallel and getting some lovely shots of the coastline itself. But um, it was, like I said in the introduction, as it entered Tel Aviv, the, it looked, you know, it looked great, didn't it? And I on mean, the coming climb, into I the mean, city. The, the, the crowds were fantastic. Uh, the, the race had a very warm welcome. Again, security almost non-existent, it seems, around the crowds at, at the, the finish and at the start as well. The crowd's almost out of control, you know, yeah. on, on the climb in particular. Well, yeah, I actually spoke to Lars back, who was in the break, and uh, he was riding up that hill with the fans. Um, you know, they were getting very close. I mean, it was it was the kind of thing you see in the, the, the high mountains on the Giro and the Tour de France, uh, the spectators, you know, almost, uh, well, carried away with the sense of occasion. And, it looked uh, like a running race at it, one point. It didn't it? There were Any, two, two riders and, and about eight runners. Indeed. Keeping well, pace. Yeah, let's hear what Lars Back's impressions of the, the race and the crowd were today. How was your day out in the break today? Oh, it was actually uh, Kambanata should have been in the break to take the seconds, but um, they didn't want to let him go. And uh, first, it was not my intention to pull in the breakaway, but uh, then we, we had the gap. And then, uh, then uh, yeah, BMC had a good plan. And um, but then we still, I still tried to fight for the mountain jersey and. Um, and then actually I was happy that we are caught back so I could save my energy. It was crazy on that hill, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah it was. It was more dangerous here in the end because people were lying down and taking pictures and I don't think they're used to cycling here so uh, definitely uh, it, was, it was really dangerous. A lot of people in the end, uh, I didn't expect so many people but they stand often on, the, on the one meter out of the road, that was, that was dangerous so I hope tomorrow it will be better. While we're just wrapping up, mopping up the break as the peloton did, I also spoke briefly with uh, Guillaume Boavin, the rider, Canadian rider with the Israel Academy team. Uh, he had one simple objective today, well, having got into that break, but it didn't quite come off. Unfortunately, the bunch was, uh, was just too close, and uh, one guy from the bunch jumped across and passed me in the last 100 metres of the KOM. That was pretty heartbreaking, but uh, yeah. It was a beautiful day out there, and uh, we just tried to show the show the jersey for our fans that have been uh, unbelievable uh, since we arrived in Israel. So, yeah, it was a good day, but close but no cigar. We'll try again tomorrow. Yeah, when we saw the bunch was coming back so quick, I was a bit surprised. I mean, we could assume BMC wanted to go for that sprint, but we were hoping we were going to have enough uh, time at least because all we wanted really was just to play for that KOM that was the only goal really so uh, I was the last one of the break but uh, I think uh, was it Barbin from uh, Bardiani yeah, he just passed me in the last I don't know 100 meters or something which which was heartbreaking it was insane lots of people really insane so uh, thanks Tel Aviv and then uh, tomorrow we got another one yeah would have been really nice to get the jersey that was more more the plan it wasn't wasn't really my job it was just something we had to do as a team you know second time was more uh, just to show the jersey it wasn't there uh, I wasn't killing myself out there so it was okay yeah yeah feeling good now I'm uh, gonna go uh, recover and uh, yeah try to do a good day tomorrow 
So no King of the Mountain jersey for the Israel Cycling Academy team today, but they were off the front uh, more or less from start to not quite finish, but almost a lot as, of the day. Almost as predictable as a Viviani win at the end of the day. And we haven't really spoken about Viviani, but he's having a great season. He is uh, a very popular rider. Um, he was very popular when he was at Team Sky. And, and I remember two years ago at the Giro when he was outside the time limit on the stage into Arezzo, the White Road stage that was won by... Uh, Brambila, uh, uh, quite a memorable day for us, I remember, because we got lost. We did get lost. We and, and so did Viviani. Yeah. We were outside the time limit. We were. And so, were Vivi so was Viviani. But Viviani was far more gracious about it than we were because he sent a, a WhatsApp message to all his teammates and the staff at Team Sky apologizing very kind of effusively. And, and, and he was obviously, obviously really upset him to be kicked out of his national tour and I saw the message that he sent and it was uh, yeah very emotional so he's back at the Giro I think it's the first his first time here since then because he didn't ride yeah, last year he didn't ride a single Grand Tour last year for Sky no one of the reasons he, he left I suspect but he uh, yeah won, won the stage today as everybody expected to do because he's been he's having a fantastic season yeah and I think you know, we're, we're guilty because the sprinting field isn't a hundred you know isn't as the deepest is it a lot of the top sprinters aren't here but it's a it's a really good solid evenly matched um, field there's not a huge number of opportunities for them either obviously tomorrow's stage into a lap you imagine will be a sprint finish um but, we, you know, we shouldn't just gloss over Viviani's win uh, and, and take it for granted because he sure, uh, he sure isn't. But it's been a great season for him so far. You know, he won a stage of the Tour Down Under at the start of the year, a couple of stages and the overall at Dubai, a stage in Abu Dhabi, and he also won the three days of Dapana, Dorida as a... Dapana de Coxida. The, the, the one day, three the days one of day, Dapana. three day race. Um, so, you know, he's ticking over with the wins, but again, within the context of the Quick Step team, who have been absolutely on fire uh, for months now, uh, Viviani's victories, you know, have, have, have gone a little bit under the radar, but to come here to, to win on the first opportunity in the Grand Tour season for him, you know, that's something that takes some doing, really. A lot of was, expectation and I knew, pressure. I knew he was going well when I saw him ride that first 400 metres of the time trial on <laughs> Friday. Flying, absolutely flying. Uh, you a are blue bullet. quite a talent spotter, Rich. <laughs> well, yeah. His team as well, were not, there were, there were uh, as I, always on the first sort of sprint stage of a Grand Tour, you see teams trying to really assert themselves and sometimes doing so in perhaps not the, the, the smartest way. And Lotto and El Yumbo were at the front very early today um, for Danny Van, Van Poppel. His brother, Boy Van Poppel, was fined today for not wearing the correct attire wow. and the sign-on. There you go. There were a few weird fines today, just out of the start. Um, Lionel Marie was fined. Uh, he's a sports director uh, for Israel Cycling Academy for having an underage guest. I've never seen that before. No, well. Um, anyway, uh, all sorts of rules and regulations at the Giro. Why are you looking at me like that? Well, I'm wondering what that could be. Does that mean uh, I guess if you somebody have a in a guest car, pass, maybe under the age of 18, not allowed to go in a team uh, yeah, maybe, car or something maybe, like that? Maybe. We'll, we'll check that out. It's worth investigating, isn't it? It is. Oh. Quick step, we're not that visible at the front. And Viviani, in the end, had to do an awful lot. He came from well back. Um, Zdenek Stebar was... was quite visible a bit earlier on and closed a few gaps and you know because there were a few late attacks Katusha were who had three guys in the top 10 at the time trial they obviously had a you know a, a kind of mad idea to try and sneak off Tony Martin or yeah was, I mean uh, never that it was a long Tony shot. Martin is not the kind of rider who can just sneak off I mean he's quite noticeable isn't he I mean yeah but you know by the same token if he gets a little gap he's quite a, a hard man to catch yeah true it's nice to see teams having a go I would say um, but Viviani the favourite and, uh, and, and a very very uh, solid win for him The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport independent research shows 10% of sports nutrition products which get a professional rider banned trust Science in Sport the world's highest standard of pan substance testing. Thank you to Science and Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. 25% off all your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. That's available to you if you have a UK address. Um, and speaking of fueling and nutrition, Lionel, few complaints 
that we didn't talk about food last night. Well, we recorded prior to our dinner. Oh, that's right, we did. Uh, yeah, two but minutes. But you had, I mean, we'd been in Israel at that point at least 24 hours, which means you'd, you'd eaten quite a lot by that point. <laughs> you know, you yeah. packed away. But last night's meal was interesting. Uh, it was recommended to me by somebody to try the shush barak. I was told it was kind of meatballs in a cheese sauce. It was it was unusual ish because the meatballs were actually in a sort of dumpling, so they were. It was were, more like ravioli. It was more like ravioli, and uh, in a in a goat's cheese sauce, which had a, it was it was an acquired taste really. It took me a couple of mouthfuls to um, really get into it, but then once I got going but by your second plate, yeah, you I were mean, really a, enjoying it. A, a bit like pedalling a big gear. The first couple of revs were tricky, but then once I was up to speed, I was racing through my. We dish. should mention the the meal we had the night before. Um, mm. Showing a shocking lack of imagination, we actually ate in the same place two nights in a row. Well, there was a good reason for that, there really, was, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah. Um, struggled to find anywhere that was open last night. Uh, so we were in an American uh, restaurant, hotel restaurant, weren't we? Yeah, and it was, but it was very nice. And we had local food there and local wine, which was mm. very nice as well. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much to friends of the podcast if well, you've been signing up because... Uh, I hadn't actually worked out the exchange rate mm. at the point mm. where I ordered the wine, the, the wine that was recommended to me. Um, yeah, I mean, part of travelling to other countries is, you know, getting to grips with uh, a little bit of the... But there's that beautiful moment where you d- you haven't got to grips with the exchange rate and it's not like real money, it's, it's yeah, like Monopoly money. Yeah, but then money. when we did the sums, we, we worked out that that was that was quite an eye-watering bottle of wine. It was very nice. Thecyclingpodcast.com if you'd like to sign up as a friend <laughs> of the podcast. Or that might be the last bottle of wine of the Giro, <laughs> I think. But uh, no, we had a delicious uh, local food, lots of hummus and mez type dishes that were, you know, with the flat bread, which was lovely, just what we needed. Yeah. So that's all been very nice. And uh, we're looking forward to a nice meal in Tel Aviv tonight, I hope. Any other business from this morning, Lionel? Well, we I was going around sort of talking to a few people for our Kilometre Zero, which will be out on Monday. So, you know, it's always strange, isn't it? After an opening time trial, um, the, the race hasn't really settled into a rhythm yet. So it was just interesting that, you know, Haifa, by all accounts, a very beautiful town, but we were sort of in a car park outside the football stadium. It, it wasn't, you know, perhaps the, the most beautiful place to start. This morning. Well, not the car park. No, I mean the the town itself is 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 very beautiful. Well, we we only have that on recommendation. We didn't actually get to see it, unfortunately. Yeah, I googled it, Lionel. Ah. Um, so uh, I I spoke to Michael Woods, the Canadian uh, education first Drapak rider who finished second at Liège Bastogne Liège recently and is coming into this Giro, really looking to build on the um, performance that he produced at the Vuelta last year which was a bit of a breakthrough for him and only his second Grand Tour uh, last the Giro last year was his first ever Grand Tour he's not a young rider but he is um, still developing I suppose as a, as a stage race rider in particular here's what he had to say at the start this morning Mike you come into the Giro with a, a great great ride at Liège Bastogne on Liège what's your sort of mood coming into the race? Pretty relaxed and excited and happy because of Liège definitely a bit of a weight left off my shoulders I wanted to get a bigger result this year, and that's, I think, one of the results that I was really hoping for. Now I can carry that with some confidence into this race. Was it a surprise, or did you feel that the form was, was there? Yeah, it was a big surprise. I was not going well all through the start of the season. Had did not have the start to the season that I wanted. Once the, the Ardennes started, I started feeling better each with each one. And in Liège, all of a sudden, like it just clicked. I felt like I was the rider la- I was last year felt super light and relaxed and confident and yeah it was like I, I was I was so surprised in the race like I was just riding this high the whole time and w- almost worried that I, I wasn't as good as I was, wasn't gonna be as good as I was feeling but I was what is that is that a mental thing or a physical thing or, or a bit of both I think it's a bit of both Juan Manuel Garate my director uh, one of my directors says is like to talk to me about this a bunch this year how like your mind has to be has to be connected with the body and the two have to be uh, in sync and maybe at the start of the season your legs are ready because you've done all the training but your mind's not ready to suffer and uh, for me because I got sick uh, I needed to kind of suffer a bunch just get my ass kicked for the first few races of the season until finally I got that connection 
So here at the Giro, are you going to tackle this in the same way you did the Vuelta, where you, you rode an aggressive race, you're trying to win a stage, but you still also managed to finish in the top 10. Is that kind of what you're aiming for here? Yeah, certainly that style of racing. Like The big goal is to get a, get a stage win. I just don't have the legs to do uh, a good time trial. Um, maybe in the future I'll be able to, but it's it's certainly a weakness still for me. So that being said, I'm not, I'm not a guy that's really in contention for a podium in the GC unless something crazy happens. So I have to race aggressive and I have to race to try and win a stage. So that was Michael Woods, uh, who admitted that he was surprised by his performance at Liege, Baston Liege, but he needed that. He needed that for confidence coming into this race. And he is an interesting character, you know, former runner. I said this last year, but he reminds me so much of Greg LeMond. He, he talks like Greg LeMond. He sounds like Greg LeMond. And he, he speaks in these short, short, sort of breathless bursts. And there's a, you know, and I think partly because he's so new to the sport still, it's all new to him and he's a bright guy and so he's taking a lot in and he's he's good at sharing that um which is which is great so we hope to speak to him a lot during this giro um but we should wrap things up for tonight lionel because we're in tel aviv and there's a lot to lot to see and eat here there is indeed and uh well we'll be back tomorrow evening after the final stage here in israel before the transfer back to sicily indeed thank you very much lionel thank you richard a community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Ci giro nella tenevo giardina che la raccolgo, l'acqua non vina, ci giro nella tenevo giardina che la raccolgo.